Welcome to the stage, Amy Gentry. First failure of the night. Uh, first of many. Um, because, because I was, uh, I write about lots of things, but because I was invited here uh, primarily and first um, because of my writing about costumes, I decided, and because Labyrinth is a, I think you can call it a, a film about costumes in many ways, um, I wanted to dress appropriately. So this is my Labyrinth themed outfit, which incorporates <laughs> the poet sleeve. A key visual element of Labyrinth, I'm sure you'll agree. So how many of you have um, seen Labyrinth before? Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's like a few boyfriends out there that have it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Labyrinth is a film in many ways, and Lars and I have talked about this, the way that it's uh, been a little bit hurt um, in some ways by its fandom, actually, and by its kind of seems like overexposure. I mean, even right now, there are places in Austin tonight that are screening Labyrinth, but don't worry, this is the better screening. Um, so, uh, you know, from Jennifer Connelly's kind of undeniably wooden performance to uh, David Bowie's antics with those Muppets, um, there's, there's a lot to uh, laugh about, a lot of jokes to be made, and uh, you could really do a whole thing just on David Bowie's pants. As we know, but uh, those, are, those pants are very important to a lot of young women, um, and uh, probably some young men as well. Uh, but I think it's really important to ask why the film has really had such sticking power and become, it was a kind of a flop when it was first released, or at least didn't do like that well. But it has stuck around in a way that um, the other Henson feature from that era, um, Dark Crystal, has not really had the same kind of sticking power. And uh, there's a lot of reasons for that. There's the script, the wonderful script by Monty Python's um, Terry Jones. Uh, <clears throat> there's you know the slithery Bowie who just kind of imparts this weird, creepy sexuality to the whole film. Uh, and of course, there's an incredible scale and sophistication of the puppetry, which was really more sophisticated than anything Jim Henson had done up to that point. Um, but I really think that it is worth taking a second look at Connolly and Connolly's performance in the context of her career at this moment. And that's why it was so intriguing to me, the idea of pairing these two films together. Phenomena, um, Dario Argento's film was, was filmed immediately prior to Labyrinth. It was the one she did right before. And uh, it was her first starring role in a feature film and only her second um, feature at all. Uh, and I'm not going to try and argue that Jennifer Connelly's performance is like a great one or that she is a great actress in these movies, but there is something incredibly poignant about her. And there's a quality she brings, which I believe is really partly responsible for um, the enduring quality of these films, especially with young women. Um, and I'll, I'll sort of explain what I mean by that. Um, she started out modeling at the age of 10, uh, Jennifer Connelly did. Her, her father was a garment industry guy, and a friend of his was like, hey, your daughter is stunningly beautiful, which is creepy. <laughs> uh, she should start modeling now, she did. And by 11, she was being introduced by Sergio Leone, and she was having her first uh, ever big screen role in uh, Once Upon a Time in America, where she is introduced to the audience through a peephole, um, and to the main character, through a peephole. She plays a young version of the heroine, and she's dressed in this kind of doll-like way, in a white dress, and she does this very puppet-like ballet dance, and the main character falls instantly in love with her, and we do too. And that is the beginning of our infatuation with the puppet-like Jennifer Connelly. <laughs> um, and I, <laughs> uh, by, by, by uh, an interview, she actually compares herself at that age, uh, 11 through 14, which is when the, uh, those three films, the Once Upon a Time in America through Labyrinth, were filmed. She compares herself to a puppet at that age, um, saying that she was so eager to please the adults around her. That she walked in a kind of, you know, she was mimicking other people whenever she didn't know what to do. And she did it really well. She was really well known for her professionalism and her punctuality and, you know, uh, 
on Labyrinth set, for example, uh, both Bowie and Tencent say that you know it's really easy to forget that she was 14 years old. She just acted like you know like she was an adult, and they and <laughs> what comes across on the screen is not so much that maturity as a tension between her eagerness to be mature and her kind of childlike pliancy and malleability. Right? She did what she was told. She is a good doll on the set. Um, and uh, some of those sets, <laughs> like Phenomena, we'll talk about a little bit later, were pretty terrifying places to be. Uh, but I, I think the doll-like quality of Connolly is kind of what makes her special in a movie that's all populated by dolls and puppets, right? Um, it's, it's kind of a movie that is about, um, you know, it's a genius move, basically, to pair her with these, uh, these puppets. Um, as you pan in um, over her room, notice uh, the way, and many of you will have already probably noticed this in prior viewing, but notice the way the movie sets up her life as a stage of dolls, crowded with dolls. She's a girl who is resisting growing up and taking care of actual babies, right? Um, her little brother, who uh, is the catalyst for this, um, for this story, she resists taking care of them in order to stay in her fantasy world and play with her dolls. Now, this is an aspect of Labyrinth that I think ladies can really relate to. Uh, the idea that you would want to put aside your poet blouses to do babysitting for your little brother for the rest of your life, uh, thus being inaugurated into the wonderful world of mature femininity, is, uh, is something many of us probably as, as youngsters felt a resistance to. Um, there's a, a rich kind of visual collage of backstory in that opening scene, which uh, explains that her backstory has to do with her mother, an actress, running off with, uh, with a, a David Bowie-looking kind of guy. Um, so there's all these sexual kind of tr uh, uh, projections going on as well. Um, David Bowie enters the film with a menace. Uh, by the way, the other, the other rock stars that were considered for this role included Sting and Michael Jackson. So just <laughs> wrap your head around that a little bit. Um, and, and actually, an, another a big contender for the part of uh, Sarah was um, Helena Bonham Carter. So just imagine like an alternate world where like Helena Bonham Carter and Sting. <laughs> <laughs> very, very different kinds of movies. Uh, um, but, it, but, but ultimately, uh, Jareth, who is the, uh, you know, the figure of sort of seductive menace who's trying to um, inaugurate Sarah's budding sexuality uh, is not nearly the scariest thing about this film. And uh, the other thing that I, that I, if you haven't already noticed this when you've watched the film, there are so many like super creepy um, kind of sexual menaces towards Sarah, right? Um, the most notable of which is uh, one that Terry Jones came up with and is very proud of coming up with. Uh, the, uh, the Pit of Helping Hands. Uh, perhaps the film's most memorable and best executed to me um, sort of metaphor for what it's like to come of age as a kind of creepily beautiful but very, very young girl who doesn't have, uh, who doesn't yet have control over her own um, body, right? Um, so just keep track of those images. Uh, there's a lot of stuff with lipstick in this movie. Uh, Sarah's relationship with the lipstick is also something to track. Um, and, we'll, and we'll talk a little bit more about, um, after the film, about kind of its relationship to phenomena and, and how her performance is um, slightly different, but I think still in many ways bears this out in that film. Um, but uh, my hope in this pairing is even if you've seen Labyrinth, or phenomena a bunch of times, is uh, just that you will sort of see them kind of like reading uh, uh, the Lewis Carroll's two masterworks back to back, right? Um, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There, which is a, a darker, creepier, and more um, a sadistic version, I think, of the first book, right? Um, 
After all, horror stories and fairy tales are kind of looking glass versions of each other, right? So um, I would urge you to watch Labyrinth, if you can, as a horror story about uh, coming of age as a woman. And then think about watching uh, uh, the Dario Argento film as, I guess, a fairy tale. Um, and we'll talk more about what <laughs> happens there. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, thanks everybody. Um, uh, so Andrew Saris, the film critic, said uh, that we're too close to the popular culture of our time to really understand it and to get it. But at this point with Labyrinth, we're like almost 30 years away. So let's just go ahead and take a hack at it. Okay. And try, and try, to, try to understand it. Because like, when I look at this movie, I think, oh well, it's such a part of uh, my childhood and probably everybody's childhood of, of all the Henson creatures and everything, but imagine if it was like, if you're looking at a movie from like 1933, and it's like, this is what all the adolescent girls in Germany were watching and they were obsessed with it for decades. <laughs> then you'd be like, wow, that's of incredible historical interest. Yes, yes, but I, I think it is. I, um, uh, well, do you, do you wanna? No, no, I was, just, I, was just, I was just creating like a, a, uh, oh, a like doorway a, we could okay, walk through doorway. here in our discussion. Okay, well, things, things girls were obsessed with in 1986 in America. We've already gone over poet blouses and vests, which uh, is a shared interest of David Bowie and Sarah. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, well actually, the, I was thinking, I can't believe I missed this, but on the, that very first, the way it opens with her addressing directly um, the camera and thus us, the audience, or the director, right? Because, um, because Jareth is, is, at least in my mind, when I'm thinking of her as this young, uh, kind of confused actress, um, she, who's she getting pushed around by in real life? So, so it's like Bowie's the director, kind of? Well, like, yeah. I mean, he's all through the, um, the film. This is a thing that I, I read about online, like, right before coming, so I didn't want to <laughs> say it in case it wasn't true. But it is. There's um, his faces. Um, are all like there's like five or six um, sort of wide shots where his face is kind of hidden in the scenery. There's one really obvious one where he, the rock formations form his face, but there's a bunch of other ones where he's kind of just like hidden, blending into the scenery. And yeah, I mean he's he's the all-knowing, you know. He sets up the the maze and makes her run through it like a rat. And so very very directorial relationship to her. So this movie has, I mean, it, it's, so, it's so much like a dream. It's, first of all, it's hard to imagine in a commercial context of, I mean, Jim Henson had to have a lot of juice to get this movie made as it was. It's hard to imagine in a commercial context, it would be like, can't we just make this into like the one of the like four or five narratives that we already know? It's, it's so different, it's so unusual, and it's so dreamlike. What, what is this movie saying? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think, um, okay. I mean, I've already said the, the thing about her um, being having this kind of this kind of problem, right? Like she doesn't want to let go of her childhood fantasies, of, of uh, which encompass romance, but it's very like childish way. And um, and her, you know, in the beginning, her stepmother like accuses her of not dating appropriately, and um, and she doesn't, you know, she'd rather have like a doll than a baby. <laughs> she'd rather so. I think, like, by, I mean, it's pretty clear that by the end of the movie, she's supposed to have conquered that, um, and, like, in, in a really typical standard fairy tale way, she has, like, come of age, she puts away her childish choice. But I think it's really significant that, you know, Henson, like, ever the, the you know, lover of, of the child and all of us, you know, Henson, like, subverts that in the very last, like, two seconds of the movie. And it's like, no, actually, she doesn't grow up. She just decides to play with toys forever. Oh, well. <laughs> and I really love that. I really love that about this movie on, on second, um, well, second watch in the last week, anyway. <laughs> so eventually, it's kind of, you, you don't actually really have to grow up, maybe? Is that is that well, the message that we're left with? Well, the movie is like staging the tension between, I mean, that, it's, just, it's just kind of catching that tension and her, um, I like that she doesn't actually have to, 
choose. I mean, the movie also stages a bunch of different ways that sexuality could go wrong for, for a young woman. Like, Jareth is obviously, you know, not, not exactly like a, a good version of this adult love interest. Oh, also, in early versions of the script, there was a kiss um, written, scripted between um, Dareth and Sarah, probably at the ball scene, although I don't know when exactly. But they took it out. Can you guess why? Because <laughs> he's 38 and she's 14. <laughs> there's a lot of balls in this movie, oh, come to yeah, think of it. There's, yeah. the, there's the sort of crystal ball, right? And then they have a ball, uh -huh. and then there's the ball. always they balls, have a ball in a ball. which you see They're, a yes. lot. They have a ball in Bowie's balls. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a, the, the, you start, I started noticing Bowie's crotch a lot. And it's like, it's like that outfit is constructed, because they clearly could have created an outfit that wouldn't accentuate his crotch bulge. His crotch bulge is intentional. Could they have really done that though? Could they have? <laughs> <laughs> Like that's intentional. That's an intentional part of the narrative. Is his crotch yeah. bulge? Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I concur. <laughs> All right, now we got that out of the way. I, I, is he Jewish? Um, I, I, I don't. Never, never mind. Okay. I, was, I was I was making a pancake yeah, joke. They they rejected um, that. I didn't buy my joke. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, um, oh, I was going to say something. To continue. To yeah, say, before my dick joke, please about continue. About David's, about David's going bulge. I was just going to continue with that for a while. Because the costume design is um, is actually sort of credited to the same guy who did the overall concept of the film, um, Brian Froud, I think his name is. He's a British illustrator. And I, I thought it was kind of, because I always look at costume stuff. I always want to know. And um, in this film, it really seems like, you know, like the whole film is, I mean, the costumes are really, are an extension of the, like, you know, the look of the film. Like, does that make sense? Like, yeah, like everything is kind of a costume. <laughs> like, that's every, this, it's such a um, packed film. The, the rocks have costumes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's not such a distinction between um, people and what they're wearing and objects, because obviously also this is a, a film that's filled with objects that are characters. So uh, you, when we were talking about this, you mentioned that like this Jennifer Connelly is a really special element above and beyond just any other just very striking and beautiful teenage girl. Like that she adds something special to it that Jennifer Aniston would not have added or something. I, yeah, that's a, that's a really weird version yeah, of that. Yeah, you're just trying to think of like, who else was around well, that age at this well, time. I and mean, yeah. you can look at the people that were actually maybe going to get cast. Like Helena Bonham Carter didn't get cast mostly because she had the British accent and they didn't, they wanted her to be like an American girl. But um, you know, she's a much better actor. Like I think we can agree that uh, Helena Bonham Carter Sarah would have been a, maybe like more <laughs> had a wider range and like been more believable. But um, yeah, like I I actually think that um, Jennifer Connelly's Deer in the Headlights kind of frozen you know, her, her dollishness in that movie basically adds something really strong to it. It means that when she looks into the camera and, and says, you know, you have to have power over me, uh, I feel like she's talking to, you know, the, the, the culture. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I do, I feel like she's talking to, like, she's talking to the directors who, you know, she just came off this experience filming Phenomena right before this, which, not, we're not, we don't have to segue yet, but that was not a very good experience for her. In fact, it was so bad that she does not, it's like expunged from her official interview chatter. Like she does, they, no one ever asks her anything about it in interviews, even when they're talking specifically about that period of her life. And it was her first starring role, so it's a big omission. So then to see her kind of go from that, like nightmarish experience with Argento to, um, to uh, to Labyrinth with Jim Henson, who's I I think I think it's fair to say he was probably less creepy to work with <laughs> than Dario Argento. Um, I, I I think that like uh, I don't know I, for me that adds a lot kind of that glazed look that she has. It, it really like means something when she's able to break through, and she does it doing using a script. I mean she does it using lines. 
Um, but she, she makes them her own, she you know, becomes her own. She has agency, she gets her agency as an, as an actor in that, at the end of that film. And, and maybe she's representing in a way like this, this um, as, she's, as she's going through this adolescent period, which is a time when you know, she's entering this world of changing roles, uh, you're, or you're about to enter like this drama in your life of sexuality and possibly reproduction and mating and all this kind of thing. It, it sounds grim, doesn't it? It does. But <laughs> mating. <laughs> mating. <laughs> reproduction. But it is, like that's what it is, you know? That you're about to enter that, that world and that, that there are, there is a tendency or, or has been a tendency for women to be sort of directed by men, their role in the in this pageant to be directed by men, and that for for her to, to say, you know, you have no power over me, and that she's going to choose her own course is possibly, in a way, like a very positive, sort of feminist, possibly kind of way of looking at it. Well, I mean, you know, I want to see it that way. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> I mean, I I think um, I really think there's a reason why women responded super, super strongly to this when they were little girls. And, um, and, I, and I think also Bowie as, <laughs> Bowie as like a, a quasi love interest is so peculiar mm -hmm. because of his, um, you know, he, he, whatever, he's got the overt male sexuality. We don't need to, we don't need to go into specifics. <laughs> we all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, Covered that territory, but also, um, but also we've got that androgynous, like, glam quality that share the same taste in clothes, you know? <laughs> um, so I feel like, uh, I don't know, I feel like there's, there's multiple things to identify with in that. There's multiple kind of almost perverse things to identify with. It's significant that it's not like Mel Gibson, you know? Yeah, it's not a role. doodly dude or a, right. yeah. I mean, I'm glad it wasn't Michael Jackson. I mean, because Bowie's a, a trifle more <laughs> traditionally masculine, um, yeah, well, and I mean, and manly, and you know, well, just and threatening sexually. Then yes, I think that's the key. He has to be kind of both androgynous and more sexually threatening than the the ordinary like love choice of a fourteen year old girl. I mean, he, he really like it's creepy when he's coming on to her. I mean, they're like he's a little sexy too, but it's like pretty creepy, especially if you. No, she's fourteen. She doesn't look fourteen in this. I mean, she looks like a, she looks she's twenty-two. 14. <laughs> she, uh, she, you look at her and you go, "This is this is a really tough conflict because I want to think she's so hot, but she's 14. Uh. Other I, other guys have expressed that um, upon <laughs> mentioning this film too, but it's important that that's exactly why I think she's a good choice mm -hmm. because she, I do think she looks. 14-ish, 15-ish, but um, mostly because of that quality, like that, because of that deer in the headlights quality. She does look like physically she could be older. She's just stunningly beautiful, it's ridiculous. But that's that's that point of like, um, she seems to me in, in these films, like a girl who's more beautiful, um, so like she doesn't realize how beautiful she is, or like people, she doesn't realize how, see, how people see her. It's like other people have control as long, as soon as they begin sexualizing her before she's really owned it, that's when she loses control. And that's when an actress or an actor, I mean, that's like the whole drama of being looked at on a screen um, and the one way direction of the gaze, right? As long as you're just being looked at, the, you know, there's like, I don't know, yeah, there's no agency in being looked at necessarily. And that's, and that's why the metaphors like the, the helping hands, and, you know, like all the kind of creepy ways she gets like manhandled and like just inappropriately like kind of sized up in this film. To me, that's kind of what, what that's about. It's like navigating the like crazy terrain of a world that like has more control over your body than you do. Yeah, that's it, that's that's a really that really comes across, I think, especially in the big screen when you're really considering everything that she's kind of literally going through in this movie. Yeah. And speaking of going through it and having everything right there, like her room is so much that just the the sort of everything it kind of explodes out of that and becomes this landscape that she's in. Like, what's going on there? It's like a girl's room. Mm -hmm. Very important. 
I don't know. I mean, I love that scene late in the movie. I think that's one another one of the most successful scenes in the movie that I always kind of forget about. The scene where she goes back and is like, okay, well maybe I will live this fantasy of childhood, holding on, not letting go to anything. She ha she loves her stuff and she just surrounds herself with it and like, you know, doesn't want to throw anything away, doesn't want to let her little brother have this toy. And um, and then that gets like revealed to be its own kind of um, perversity. Like she's gonna end up like that lady. <laughs> but that's but that's but that's you know the old lady in the in the junkyard with her back with all the stuff on it. That's another um, we say like that's another version of like the monstrous feminine, right? That's like a hat. That's an asexual. Um, you know, barren, dried up lady, right? Well, you're never gonna realize your potential as a lady and get with it and reproduce and stuff, mating. Um, you're gonna end up this dry husk of a woman with all your, you know, clutching your toys. You know? It's like this extreme sort of ultimate fear of becoming this cat lady, kind of. Yeah, yeah, cat lady, yes. Right. That's, that's good, she's, she's a total cat lady. Yeah. So um, anytime you see a movie like this that manipulates so many symbols, like you wonder, like did they, did they reach in their unconscious and say, oh, well, let's just throw this out there. Let's just get all this unconscious stuff out there. Or do you think that they really worked it out in terms of like this Jungian symbols and like putting it, arranging it and everything like that? I always, always wonder about that. Like there's so much there. Yeah. And making like a, a giant expensive movie like this that takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of people, it's, it's really unlikely that you're just throwing a thing that you had a dream about up on screen. Yeah, well there was a lot, a lot of different people worked on the script actually. Terry Jones wrote the first draft of it and then um, uh, Henson worked on it and George Lucas worked on it a lot, which to which I attribute like that whole last battle sequence. I'm like that's totally Lucas. He like he was like, he was like always trying to put in more action and stuff apparently. And uh, Elaine May Really? Yes. <laughs> wow, that's so cool. An uncredited, yeah, an uncredited, um, I guess like script doctor or whatever. So a lot of hands were on it, um, and actually Terry Jones like said that after the Helping Hands e episode, it was a lot less his after that. Like I think he only really owns the movie up to that point these days. But um, but that, that he talks about the moment of creation of in that moment specifically, and to me that is a very like I mean you know it's super dimmy. It's a the pit, the shaft that goes into a dark womb-like place, and it's uh, and it's got the hands, etc. Um, he does not when he talks about it in interviews. He does not appear to you know have any like attachment to symbolism. He's just like it seemed like that'd be really creepy. So I don't know. I mean, I think it came out of his unconscious, but um, and. and uh, you write about um, a number of things, style included. Uh, we kind of talked a little bit about the, the, some of the costumes at the beginning, but like, what is the significance of goblin sleeves? Why is that significant? Goblin sleeves? Isn't that what you call them, a goblin po blouse? Poets. Poet sleeves. Poet sleeves. I'm sorry, <laughs> goblins, poets, same thing. <laughs> it was a Christina Rossetti thing, goblin market. Goblin market, you know. yeah. Um, okay. See, I read a book. <laughs> Poet, um, poet blouses, well, like, first of all, I think they were just in the 80s, so there's that. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're just super, like, ridiculous, over-the-top romantic, you know? They're supposed to, they're supposed to be, you know... They convey this sort of universal past that is not actually a real past. Yes, oh, oh good, yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, like, faux Renaissance, you know, like, Renaissance fair stuff. A quest? Oh, because he also has. We have a equestrian from the audience. <laughs> equestrian in the audience. <laughs> so uh, I, I think let, let's uh, let's go ahead and transition into our next film, which is a really wiggy, weird sort of flip side of some of the same sort of the same coin in a way. And and after that movie, the four people who are going to stick around will have will continue. We'll have another little bit of a discussion, including some some uh, equestrian from the audience. <laughs> um, but, I, but I do want to go ahead and uh, flip on into Phenomena, a.k.a. Creepers. We're watching the shorter Creepers cut, for those of you who didn't catch that. Um, so this movie is fucked. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this movie is real weird. It, and it's an outrage against 
So like, we, like again, what we're saying with Labyrinth is like this Jim Henson's probably very loving, sad of like people who love their work and love each other and love their families. To go for, to, um, for, for her, because this was made before yeah. Labyrinth, she went onto this set and it's like a bunch of like chain smoking scumbags, you know, <laughs> in, in the Italian industry. And instead of having like a whole crew that's like, hey, I'm the soup guy, I'll bring you some soup. Like it's like, hey, you know, I'm the guy that like, like picks you up and th you know, drags you out of this cheap motel room and throws you onto the set at 6 a.m. Yeah. It's a dark movie that was probably a dark time in her adolescent life. Yeah, well, she reports that she took the movie mostly because she didn't really know what it was about or care what it was about. Um, she just wanted to go to Europe. She was 13 at the time. Um, so, <laughs> All right, let's, yeah, let, let, I just want to pause and drop like a footnote of emphasis in here. Okay, you're 13 years old. You've been in a Sergio Leone movie. The, the portion she was in was fun in New York. So she, the, the sense that she got was like, oh, this fun time. And she's like, I want to go to Europe. You know, it'll be fun to see some of the sights. And she goes to Europe and she works with like one of the most depraved, <laughs> like mo most sexually, from everything that we can tell from his films, one of the most sexually crippled people <laughs> on earth. <laughs> And then she, and she's 13 years old. So, okay, yes, continue. Yeah, um, disturbing. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, she was just, she was young. She, oh, yeah, she says in interviews these, um, these days again, oh, no, no, contemporaneous interviews, actually, when she was, like, 14 or 15, they're like, so did you always want to be an actress? And she's like, no, I kind of wanted to be, like, a vet or maybe a carpenter. <laughs> First of all, that's really the fun of Jennifer Connelly as a carpenter. It's just amazing. Um, but uh, but yeah, like she was re real naive. It seems like um, like a like a girl who I think was an, an intelligent girl and precocious in some ways, but also very naive. Um, but she did get to work with animals on the set of Phenomena. Oh yeah, wonderful. What must have been wonderful working with that chimp. <laughs> Yeah, and those and all those insects and like horrifying larvae and stuff. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But so the story that um, that is really makes me feel so strongly about this movie, among other. There's a lot of stuff I don't want to spoil because probably there are people who have not seen it. I'm like Robert. Is it? Some people have have not seen this, right? Quite a lot, I imagine. Probably. All right. All right. Okay. Yeah. So I don't want to spoil any of the big stuff. There are insects involved, a whole lot of insects, and they are real. I mean, a, most of them are real. Yeah, they were. They weren't like. There was no like special effects. There was a, a few special effects. There, there's some like manipulating of coffee grounds, I think, to make the far away insect swarms. But the close ones are just insects, and they actually cause some kind of a. They cause like a. Um, like an infestation in like a neighboring village or whatever, because they really ordered like zillions of these things, and then they reproduced. Um, but yeah, Inga the Chimp, um, supposedly- Inga the Chimp? Yeah, the Chimp, who is a really important character. And I wanna just, uh, like both of these movies have her working with animal helpers. And uh, anyway, so Inga, um, Inga was not a, um, a, there was not like a really professional animal handler around, or there, maybe there were for like five minutes and then Dario was like, well, I got it, whatever. Um, <laughs> And his, his way of like, I mean, just watching the um, interviews with uh, Daria Nicolodi, who, who was his partner at the time, uh, and is in the movie, you know, she actually um, s describes his method of chimp handling as like, just work the chimp up. Like if the chimp has an action scene or whatever, just get the chimp real excited. And the chimp is not agitated enough. Yeah, uh. exactly. <laughs> Like, uh, and it just was not done in a safe way. And at one point, the chip was like acting up and kept turning away from the camera in every scene. And so uh, apparently Argento told 13-year-old Jennifer Connelly that if the chimp turned away, she should turn the chimp back to the camera. And uh, Inga did not like this and apparently bit off part of her finger. Although this is a story that is not the extent of the damage. I'm pretty sure that there, there was a fight. Everybody involved says there was a fight, but um, Daria Nicolodi says that the entire finger was bitten off and had to be reattached at a hospital. And um, other people just say it's the tip of her finger or maybe the finger it was just a bite, a bad bite. Either way, it's pretty bad. Like this chip could kill someone. This yeah. is the, these things are able to 
like rip your arm off, you know? And here's like little 13-year-old Jennifer Connelly who's just like, what do I do now? Okay, gotta stay professional, you know? <laughs> and she, and I mean, there's a lot of stories about it, but she's not talking about it outside of her therapist's office. No, no, she isn't, she isn't. It, is, it seems like it has been barred completely. I looked through so many interviews trying to find her talking about it, and uh, they, people don't ask her about that movie. When they, when they do ask, she says, you know, well, they, they don't. I found like one really long, extensive interview where it was like glazed over really quickly, and she just kind of blinked. But I think she's, I think she's not, I think she is not to be asked about it. Yeah, it's probably like the publicists are like, hey, welcome, we're glad you're going to talk to Jennifer. Don't talk about that first, like, shitty Italian movie that she made where she got her finger bitten off by a chimp. Okay, thanks. Go on the green rooms, you know, go have some snacks in the green room. I think that's probably what happens. And, and I mean, like, her performance in, in this film, too, just to... <laughs> I mean, like, if you think she's wooden in Labyrinth, like, Phenomena, she has really got this look of um, absolute, like, what am I even doing? She kind of looks like she's sleepwalking through a lot of it. Like, she's taking her brain away. Um, again, I actually think this works kind of amazingly well for this particular film. Um, it gives her, it just gives her that lost look. Um, yeah, we, you know, we talked about the manipulation of symbols in Labyrinth and how like, oh, is that conscious or what? But I've always gotten the feeling, I, I mean, in this, and Argento has, has a really great talent for staging these scenes and setting up these sort of like, um, almost like carnival type sideshow trap things that he puts his females into, typ typically females into. Um, so he really has that. But I really don't think, I really think that Argento was just, coming up with this stuff and just throwing it out there and everybody's like, great, do it, you know? Like, I don't think that there's a whole lot of um, conscious use of symbols in his films. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't even want to presume, really. But actually, um, you know, I have seen some interviews with him recently where he does talk about, like, the, the kind of, like, I don't know, the long hallways and stuff. You know, I mean, I think he's aware, he's dimly aware on some level that these things have symbolic resonance. And some of the symbols are so potent and so just so unusual, like a burning lake, you know, like like a beautiful girl falls out of a burning boat into a lake that's on fire. It's like I don't I don't even know what that symbol means. It just sometimes you see a symbol, you go, that's a resonant symbol, whatever that means. Yeah, well, like any one of the the most beautiful images in that film really is that shot at the end where she's kind of emerging. It's one, it's one of the only truly like beautiful moments in this movie. <laughs> Uh, but those I are swimming, yeah, yeah, like the, those are beautiful. Yeah, no, yeah, they are, yeah, they are, they are. But the, just the composition of like the burning thing in the background and then her reflection kind of coming up. And she's been, she's uh, she's wearing that white dress, that virginal white dress, like it's like a kind of a schoolgirl outfit. And actually, I, I do really love the costumes in this film. This is a, By Armani, right? Yes, they, this, uh, the costumes in this film were designed by Armani and it's one of the only film, he's done tons of costume work um, over the years, but it's one of the only films where he did lots and lots of uh, women's costumes. You know, are they're more noticeable than the men's co the men's suits in this film? And um, I, I don't know. I just I I think they really kind of contribute a lot to the to the style and the look of this film, and particularly to Connolly's character. Like when you first see her and she's um, <laughs> she's unpacking in that in her new dorm room, and she's wearing those like trousers, those like fashionable slouchy um, Armani trousers. I mean, it's really kind of impeccable tailoring, FYI. But, uh, and, then, and then what does she do? She, she goes and gets a jar of baby food and starts eating it with a toothbrush. <laughs> it's like, the, it's, again, to me, it's that contrast between her kind of sophistication, like she looks really right in, in beautiful clothes. She was a model before she acted, so that makes sense. But she just has this like calm sophistication, but then coupled with this like perverse babyish naivete, where she's just like, well, I'm gonna eat some baby food. <laughs> and there's one more thing that I think is kind of fascinating about her performance, and the it, it, which is the way they dwell on her um, the scene of the her gagging up the pill. There is a lot of shots of her doing very realistic uh, gagging. And uh, it's interesting, again, because, I mean, to me, that's like a very, you know, that's a very potent symbol for like a 13-year-old girl to be doing that, like forcing herself to throw up. 
Um, especially when you consider that Argento, uh, one of his, uh, well, it's actually, this is not his daughter, it's Nicolodi's daughter, mm -hmm. but he, he was kind of raised um, as sisters with his own daughter. She, uh, she was bulimic and, and, and anorexic both and really struggled and uh, eventually died tragically young. Um, so this is just like an over, a, a note, I think that like you said, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure Argento was like thinking all this stuff through super carefully, but I do think there's some, some potency to him lingering on those images and setting up this daughter figure um, to suffer in these particular ways. So. And I did want to mention that if anybody needs a ride home, Dario Argento's waiting outside in a van. <laughs> so just get in the van, it's fine. I mean, I'm sure everything will be okay. Um, uh, Amy, thank you so much thank for you. doing this. Thank you so much for doing this. By the way, if we we're gonna do a third movie, what would it have been? What, what would our third movie have been if we were going to do a third movie? I, I want to say Requiem for a Dream just to put a theme, but I do hate that movie. I hate that movie, too. Yeah. Does anybody else hate that movie? <laughs> Good. All right. Well, we've all learned something tonight. Thank you so much, Amy, for being here. Thank you so much, you guys, for being here. I really appreciate it. Thanks.